Hello and welcome to Senior Moment. My name is David Refson and I am your host. Senior Moment is about seniors and for seniors. I am very pleased to have as my guest today Ed Orzakowski. Uh, Ed has written a book about the life of a man named Donald Vitkus and his journey from hell to a productive member of society. Ed, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. Glad to be here. So tell me a little bit about some of the early years of your life. I know uh, you did a lot of teaching, but talk a little bit about uh, that part of your life. Well, I grew up in the Florence section of Northampton, and I went to uh, Northampton High School and uh, uh, UMass, and I graduated from there. And I met my wife in first grade. Oh, is that right? <laughs> so our first date was a junior uh, prom in high school, and uh, uh, we got married after we got out of college. Um, I didn't know what to major in uh, at the time uh, because I didn't realize what interest or talent I had in writing. So I was briefly an engineer for about 10 days. I, uh, my son did the same thing and he's a writer, so yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't change. So you taught for a long time. I taught uh, for 35 years uh, at Quaybog Regional High School, which is a uh, two town district, Warren and West Brookfield. Yeah, near Sturbridge. And was literature or writing part of that? Uh... Yeah, I taught, I taught uh, high school English. Uh, I was chairman of the department. And writing was part of the, uh, of the program, uh, college composition. But there were also, this was a time when uh, elective programs were beginning in high school. So I had a short story course, uh, journalism, novel, uh, and writing. Is that what kind of led you into your own idea of writing? I'm not sure it led me into it. Uh, well, I guess it did. It prepared me for it anyway. Okay. Uh, um, I, um, I had done some writing of just short articles for newspapers or letters to the editor is really probably how I began. Right. And uh, uh, then uh, I was sort of a Walter Mitty writer, I think, okay. because I subscribed, I'm almost a, a, what do you call it, a charter <laughs> subscriber for Writer's Digest magazine. I've been just sub subscribing for a long time. And I enjoy reading about writing. I enjoy learning more about the craft. Um, and I had worked uh, part-time in radio uh, as a newsman and uh, also began a journalism class uh, where I taught. So um, all of it kind of steered me in that direction. Uh, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, you also had some connection with Straw Dogs Writers Guild. Is well, I'm a, I'm a member of Straw Dog Writers right. Guild, yeah. Um, and uh, it's a great organization, uh, and well, it's based in Northampton, right. but we have members, you know, in a wide area. Uh, and what's good about it is that you're just with other people who have a common interest, and, and you also get a lot of good tips, too. Right, that's what I was just thinking, probably more than anything else, as somebody who's uh, written a book, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, to give you some ideas how to proceed or mm -hmm. things of that nature. I think that would be very helpful. Writers humble. groups uh, are invaluable. I've been in three or four different writers groups, and they all have a different nature to them because of the membership, the people who are in that particular right. group, but they're all help very helpful. Okay. Uh, Certainly the majority of reason why we're here has to do with the history of a place called the Belchertown State School. Um, this was a school for what they then termed uh, mentally retarded people to be housed in this facility. Uh, and maybe you could talk a little bit about the history of the school. Okay. Belchertown opened, I think, in 1922. Um, and originally it was intended to be a place where people with mental handicaps, uh, not necessarily mental illness, but mental handicaps, uh, something that people were born with, uh, could go to and uh, uh, be in, out in the country and perhaps a, a healing kind of environment and be schooled and prepared for some kind of a, a job or, or life on the outside. So it began with some very uh, idealistic uh, goals. Um, but over time, it was 
understaffed, overcrowded, and under budgeted, which led to eventually a lot of problems of abuse and neglect, um, and particularly into the 1940s and 50s in that era. Um, one of the things they talk about in your book is that um, kids mostly would come into the facility, they would uh, evaluate them, and whether it was true or not, label them as, again, the words back then, mentally retarded with very, very low IQ. And it's kind of wondrous to see, in fact, was that really true all the time, especially with the tools they had back in the 50s or 40s or 60s. And uh, I think Donald is one of those kind of uh, people who mm -hmm. came in at a young age, and we'll talk about Donald in a minute. Um, so in 1972, my understanding is Benjamin Ritchie, whose son was a patient at the school, right. correct? Bobby. Yep. Bobby. Filed a lawsuit, uh, I guess with the State Department of, was it health? Against, well at that time it was called the uh, DMR, Department of Mental right. Retardation. And that was in 1972. And uh, when, when Ben realized what the conditions were like where his son was sent, first of all, he was sent there because the Amherst school system wouldn't take him. Uh, there was no special education back then. Uh, so it was common for people to be sent to Belchertown State School. Uh, and when Ben found out what the conditions were like, um, he began working with other parents. There was an organization called uh, the Friends of Belchertown. Uh, parents mostly uh, to bring goods that were not available. I mean, common things like toilet paper or toothbrushes. Uh, and then they you know, began fundraising. And eventually uh, the lawsuit came about and it was a class action lawsuit with uh, organizations of parents and guardians from other schools as well, like uh, Munson, well, it was called Munson State Hospital back then. Right. Um you had mentioned, we were talking before, that if you went to visit, and I, my understanding is your sister-in-law was a, That's right. a patient there as well, right. um, and they don't let you into the actual facility. They only let you into the visiting room. How do you think Benjamin found out about the conditions there? Do you have a sense about that? Um, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure, uh, it, well, uh, what I do know is that when he did find out about the conditions, that's w and, and when he got into the lawsuit, Judge Toro, Joseph Toro was a federal right. judge. Uh, he and Ben and a few other dignitaries uh, toured Belchertown. Okay. And as soon as Judge Toro saw what the conditions were like, he said, okay, I, I don't even need a trial. This is, uh, he issued a consent decree and that ran from 1972 to 1992, and the same judge had oversight of it all those years. Um, they went through several judges prior to that, um, I'm not sure how many, and the same thing with attorneys, until they finally found one, Beryl Cohen, uh, who was a, a state representative uh, at some point, or senator, I'm not sure. Uh, and he took the case uh, pro bono, and uh, without the convergence of those three men, Ben, Ben Ritchie, uh, Beryl Cohen, the attorney, and Judge Toro. Um, this, this wouldn't have succeeded. It just wouldn't have happened. So now we're talking 1972. The lawsuit's been <coughs> filed. The judge sees what's going on and realizes this is not a good place for folks to be. So things start to change, both um, internally, meaning was it hiring more staff? Was the policies of how they dealt with these folks change at that time? Well, I'm sure there were physical plant deficiencies that were right. uh, improved. Uh, the conditions were, I, as you said, there, people were not allowed, visitors were not allowed to be on the visiting room. So I never saw what the place was like. I learned about it from people like Donald who, who told me what it was like. Uh, so, yeah, it would, be, it would have been a gradual process of uh, improvement. Uh, uh, I've begun writing a, a book about a woman who grew up there that I met as a result of Donald, Donald's book. Mm -hmm. And she was there about 10 to 12 years after he was. 
So, by, and she tells me by the time that she was there, it wasn't a great place by any stretch of the imagination, but things had improved. The, the life wasn't as regimented as it was when Donald was there. So my understanding is part of the decree was to actually eventually close the school down, but it took a lot of time to get the folks who were patients in there into other places right. or facilities. I'm not sure it was the original intent was to close it. It was to improve it. Gotcha. And then over those 20 years, eventually it did close. And uh, you're right. People began being uh, moved out to other facilities. Uh, there was one here in Amherst called Sunrise Avenue that I think still exists. That's where my sister-in-law went when she got out of Altertown. Um, so it, it, it took a while for, for things to get to, you know, w final closure. I'm assuming that what happened over those 20 years between 72 and 92, did they possibly not take any more folks into the state school? That's right, and, yeah. and so eventually the population started to get whittled down, right? Right. Yeah. And they went out into community housing or small venue situations. Um, maybe an unfair question, but I'll ask anyway. Uh, how did it turn out for these small programs? Did, did the... Did the judge and the court see that this was a beneficial situation for the patients? Well, yes, I mean... And it, you know from Carolyn maybe a little bit yeah, about that. Yeah, um, there was resistance from communities, uh, not necessarily here in Amherst, but uh, in other towns, uh, you know, people didn't want this kind of uh, home being built in their neighborhood they, because they feared uh, what the residents would be like. Um, so uh, eventually, well, I've lost track of what my, what the question was. I mean, I have a senior moment. That's okay. No, 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 no that's okay. Yeah. It's in these small community settings. Somebody oh, like yeah. Carolyn, yeah. Uh, did she thrive in those settings? Well, I mean, was it obviously a better place than the state yeah. school was? It was sure. a better place. Uh, for, for one thing, it was a brand new facility. Okay. Uh, but part of the problem was that many of the staff that had been at Belchertown, probably the bulk of the staff, were relocated to these other homes. Okay. And it, it took a long, long time for the mindset of uh, workers to change. It wasn't just something that happened overnight just because you've got a new facility. So in some cases, these places were like mini Belcher towns. So the instances of abuse and neglect still might occur. And it was through, it's, it's the reason why and that is a reason why parent organizations like uh, Advocacy Network and the Friends right. of Belchertown exist. And they still do to some extent. They correct? still do. Okay. Now we're going to talk about part of why we're here. Uh, Ed has written a book called You'll Like It Here, which is kind of a crazy title when you hear what, what this is all about, as you've been hearing. But I wanted you to talk about how your chance encounter with Donald Vitkus happened and subsequent interaction with him. So maybe you can address that. Okay, well, through my, because my sister-in-law, Carol, mm -hmm. was a resident at Belchertown, uh, my wife, Gail, and I became involved as eventually co-guardians and in advocacy. We joined at, what it was, back then it was called, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the name, it wasn't Advocacy Network, it was uh, some, some name prior to that. But anyway, she and I both got on the board uh, and we met uh, Benjamin Ritchie, who was, for all intents and purposes, that, well, he was a driving force. Right. And Ben had written his own book called Crimes Against Humanity, right. uh, which was a chronicle of the lawsuit because he wanted this to be sort of a, a guide or a textbook for other organizations to follow if they wanted to uh, initiate some kind of a, a lawsuit like this. And he was invited to uh, speak at Holyoke Community College. And I was helping him at that time, uh, helping him with the book signing. Uh, and after uh, Ben's presentation, um, this man came up to me and said, uh, you know, I grew up at Belchertown State School and I've been looking for someone to write my story. And uh, it turns out that Donald was the one who had invited Ben Donald was the, uh, the oldest, I think at the time he was uh, 62 years old, a student at uh, Holyoke Community College. 
and he was getting his associate's degree and he was involved with a psychology club there I think and as a result uh, he invited Ben to come to speak and that's where we met. Now one of the other things you told me about Donald before we get into your interaction with him is that he worked for 30 years in a print shop. So on one level the state school couldn't have been any more wrong about this young man who they said had a 41 IQ and yet as time went on in his life he was able to accomplish a lot of stuff given what his background was in terms of those years. I mean uh, he went from foster home to foster home when he was a young boy That's right. so that in itself was trauma producing in and of itself. Yeah. So tell me a little bit now you've met Donald Vitkus and um, he says I want somebody to tell my story and you said yes obviously. I didn't say yes immediately oh, but okay. I had been about that time I was I'm not sure I had retired from teaching or not but it was pretty close to that time. So you know I, I thought well this would be an interesting project. Uh, little did I realize what it took to write a book and <laughs> right. what I had to, I had to learn how to write a book first which is one of the reasons why it took about six to seven years uh, to produce a book. Um, but uh, it, it was certainly a, a worthwhile experience. Tell me about uh, sort of the interview process. Now here you are, you're meeting with him obviously over many, many, many hours. Yeah. And he starts to relate what happened to him basically? Right. It turned out uh, it was almost like I'm not a therapist by any means, but, but it turned out that it was helpful for Donald. There'd be some times when he was telling about a very difficult experience at Belchertown and he might begin to cry and I'd, I'd ask him if he wanted to continue or not. He said, yes, I do because this is good for me. And for, first of all, he wanted the story told, right. but also it was beneficial for him to get the story out. It's, it's, uh when things like that happen, getting it out is very cathartic in a lot of ways mm -hmm. and it really can be um, s sort of life changing in a way that he doesn't have to kind of keep holding on to it and allow it to express what really happened to right. him. Right. Well, uh, you mentioned the 41 IQ. He yeah. was tested when he was three years old when he was still in the foster care system and got that result. So when he got to Belchertown, he was labeled a moron because there were, these were not just uh, slang terms, they were clinical terms, categories according to your IQ. Uh, moron, imbecile, and idiot. And moron was at the top of the heap. And because he was told so often that he was a moron, he began to believe he was, or had doubts about it at any rate. Uh, and even, even when he was, after all those years of working, uh, and uh, when we got the book out, um, he would appear at training sessions for the Department of Developmental Services in Northampton. He had been invited to, to speak mm -hmm. there to uh, uh, new, new people coming into the system. And that's the way he introduced himself. I'm Donald Vitkus, a former moron of Belchertown State School. But at least he said former. Right. right. Uh, w when he did these workshops, and even in terms of your meeting with him, was he articulate? Did he really? He's articulate. He was articulate. He was a little rough around the edges. Of course. And very outspoken. He always resisted. He hated authority of any kind. Even his own son who became a policeman, he hated that concept. He loved his son but hated the idea that he was a cop. Um, and he, he was a very moving kind of experience. I didn't realize that what kind of a friendship we would evolve over the years. Um, that wasn't the original plan or design, but through learning about intimate experiences like this, it just happens. Um, and whenever he spoke at uh, book signings, uh, I mean, that's who people really wanted to hear. They didn't want to hear me so much. They wanted right. to, to hear Donald. And he was always, I, w I was amazed at how he would rise to the occasion because he was beginning to have uh, uh, seizures. Um, mm but he, he really looked forward to these uh, reading events. So you said you had a, uh, what developed into a, a long-term friendship with him. So here he is sort of revealing 
his heart to you in a lot of ways of what's really going on and obviously that struck a chord with you on many different levels. Mm. So w was he pretty um, precise about what happened to him? Was he pretty detailed about his experience at the state school? Yes, I mean, I'd, I'd have to ask him questions because I, I want to flesh out something, a, sure. a, a conversation or where it occurred or exactly what happened. Uh, and it, it might take uh, a while to you know, get all that information, but he was, his memory was uh, you know, very detailed, very sharp about exactly what happened. Uh, those kinds of things you don't forget. How old was he when he finally got out of the school, do you know? He was turning 18 which was the time of uh, the Vietnam War. Right. So he was, uh, he had been registered for the draft by a social worker, I presume. Uh, was classified 4F, which meant unfit to serve mentally or physically, and he knew what it meant in, in his case. He was so upset by that because he had already been labeled a moron, he went down to the draft board in Holyoke and convinced them to change his status um, you, know, you know, a lot of guys were trying to keep out of Vietnam, yes, I know. but he, wa he didn't think that they would actually take him uh, to Vietnam or into the service. He just wanted the label removed, so it was like an identification for him uh, in applying for jobs. Did he didn't, so he didn't serve in the military then? He did. Oh, he did? He ended up getting drafted and he oh. served a year in Vietnam. Oh my goodness. And I always tell, the, uh, one of the ironies is, or a couple of things, for him, being in the service was, he liked it. And, and he said it was easier for him than it was for a lot of other people because he had already been accustomed to that regimented lifestyle, do this at this time, wear this. Uh, and another thing that I w I'd like to mention is that he, he carried and operated a, a machine gun or a submachine gun when he was in Vietnam. Years later, when he was living in Granby, he applied for a gun permit and was denied by the police chief because he had been institutionalized. And here he is out there with a machine gun, right? probably killing people, yeah, Probably. and learn how to deal with weapons, clearly as a result of, of the war, right. and you would think he would have been an okay candidate for that well, situation. Well, Belchertown was on his record. Right. So here he is, he gets out, I'm gonna guess around 1920, something like that, out of the army, Maybe a little bit later? Uh, well, not, he, he got out of the Army in, in, the, uh, in the 70s. Right, but I'm saying he was, how old was he? He was like 19 or 20 when oh, he I'm got sorry, it? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you said 19, uh, 20. No, 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 <laughs> I'm not that old either. Uh, yeah, he would have been uh, about 19. And so what happened to him at that point? So here he is, he gets out of the Army. I, I'm also a little surprised, maybe just a, a side thing, why he didn't continue with the Army? He didn't have to go to Vietnam anymore. But since it was a place that he liked the regimentation, <coughs> and he, he liked that thing, why didn't he continue? I'm not sure why he didn't continue. Um, um, I, I never asked him that question. Okay. Uh, he, he didn't want to make it a career. I mean, right. it wasn't his intent that he would get into the military. He just wanted that label removed, right. the 4F label. Uh, but it, it turned out for him that it was beneficial um, he, he always credits the military for teaching him a lot. So what, what does he do when he gets out? Now he's whatever, 19, 20 years old? Yeah. Well, uh, he searched for jobs and he worked for a couple of different places and ended up uh, working at, uh, uh, it was called West Vaco Envelope, I, I believe it was in West Springfield. Right. Uh, and that's where he worked for all those 30 plus years as uh, running a printing press. Um, so he didn't bounce from job to job. He, he kept a job. He, not to say he didn't have difficulties there uh, because of his past, uh, but he, he, he kept that job until the company moved to Mexico. And through NAFTA, he got uh, training, and that's why he went to Beltertown, uh, to, excuse me, to Holyoke Community College, where he had wanted to study computers because he had an interest in computers, but somehow he was steered into being a uh, human service uh, uh, caregiver. That's, where he, that's how he got his degree. And he gets married. He got married. Uh, he was married a couple of times. Uh, he had uh, a son and daughter in the first marriage. Uh, the marriage didn't last because there were conflicts, partly because of his background. And he didn't know how to, 
his job, he always said, was to go out and earn money. That was it. Uh, whatever nurturing there was for, or parenting there was, that wasn't his job because he didn't know how to do that. He sure. wasn't capable of it. He couldn't even hug his own kids mm. because uh, any kind of physical encounter at Belchertown meant abuse or restraint. Uh, so there was a time when his wife was out uh, and he was uh, caring for his son at home. This was in Holyoke. Uh, across the street, one of the uh, buildings was on fire and his building had to be evacuated. Mm. And he had to carry his son at arm's length because he couldn't clutch him to bring him downstairs. Um, pretty amazing story about this, is, yeah. this man. It really is how he goes from literally hell to be a functioning member of our society and having children and a job and serving in the armed forces. I mean, it's really... And he never gave himself enough credit for that. No, I understand. And how wrong these folks were when they tested him when he was a little boy to where he wound up. Yeah. Ed, this has been a fascinating journey. So I want to thank you very much for well, being a guest. Thank you for guest. asking me to be here. Sure. Uh, I also want to thank Amherst Media for sponsoring the show and um, uh, the folks who helped produce it. I know Faith is one of the producers. I want to thank her. So with that, I hope you'll uh, join me for the next session of Senior Moment. Thank you very much. Thank you.